Now, this is it, Pia. I, I hit the record button. We're live, and we just discussed uh, how do I pronounce your name, and I chose to just call you Pia. You can introduce yourself better than I can, so I don't mess it up. Um, I, I, I do want to welcome you to the podcast. You are not quite next door uh, since you moved around. Are you, are you in Spain, Denmark, Sweden? Where in the world are you? <laughs> right now, I'm in Spain. Okay, but you are I'm... right. I travel a lot to the Nordics as well, since uh, my customers and and a lot of my friends and family are still in the Nordics. But I do live in Spain now. Okay, I'm very jealous. Everybody I know these days is either in Spain or Portugal, <clears throat> but that's okay. So, so <laughs> Pia, I think you know. Uh, I know how I do this. Uh, we typically I like to my audience to get to know you a little bit, and then we can dive into some of the topics that are. Uh, some of your specialties. So if I uh, bumped into you when you were 15, 16 years old in Denmark, which is where you grew up, and I said, Pia, what do you want to be when you grow up? What was the answer? The answer at that time was actually that I thought I was supposed to be an accountant because my dad owned an accountant company. So I kind of stepped a bit in his foot. But then I started at business school and then I figured out that accounting was not for me. Uh, I really wanted to do the, the strategies and the marketing uh, and that instead. So I kind of changed direction. Going to university, what was your major? Uh, I actually did different kinds of um, studying. So instead of just going to university, I kind of went to a business school actually where we also had the practice in. So, so I went to um, a business school where we were concentrating on economics, actually, uh, but also a lot of marketing communication. Uh, so it's, it's kind of an all-round uh, education. And I ended up actually going to U.S., to California, to do a study there for a big radio station to study commercial radio. So, but it was definitely strategic marketing, sort of as the, the headline, innovation strategic marketing as the headline okay. of what I was doing. Uh, and then on top of that, I have a HD also in in uh, in business, and then I have a master. I have a Visa Bank card master a degree as well and stuff like that. So so I kind of shuffled a bit around. So instead of just being in the university, I kind of tried to choose some education where I also had to practice going in working with real companies on uh, sort of projects and that kind of thing and being in the field, which I really liked, instead of just so being like five six years in the university. So it's a, it's it's interesting because there is a debate that's that's going on now. I think it it's always went on, but it's more uh, it, it's more common now, especially in the U.S., where the question is, why should you waste money and time going to university? Because the cost of school in the U.S. is over the top, right? I mean. So we have state schools. I'm in New York, and we have schools that are state schools that typically are much lower cost than than private schools. So a state school in New York, and I have some very good ones. It typically, an annualized basis, let's say today, it's probably around twenty thousand dollars a year just for the school and maybe living there. But you have to start to add everything else. Maybe you wind up at twenty five, thirty thousand. So it's one hundred twenty thousand dollars to get a undergraduate degree. When you go to private schools. And I'm not going to talk about Ivy Leagues, which is most people don't even get to. Private schools will probably be double that easily, right? So could be 40,000 times four times. It, it's just incredibly high. And the reason why it's a debate of why would you why would you go spend that kind of money? And many people take loans, student loans, which is why this is a, a very active debate now. Why would you spend all that money just to come out with a piece of paper uh, and then spend the rest of your life paying off those loans or trying to catch up to to, to whatever investment it was, right? Uh, as opposed to, which is kind of similar to what you did, like maybe start the work first, get the practical experience, learn on the job, um, maybe supplement it with some with some courses and specialty courses in different areas depending on what you're interested in and and i think i i think that's brilliant but the problem in the us is because unlike the rest of the world us is very square everything has to be <laughs> followed by the rule 
and you apply for a job, if you don't have a college degree, at least before COVID, you will not be considered. I think things are beginning to change. Companies are starting to realize that, you know what, if you bring in someone and actually train them, and, and we'll talk about your very long career in the banking industry, because mm -hmm. that's one of your specialty areas, right? Not banking, but change management. But if you bring someone who is 18 or 20 years old and you get a chance to train them and mold them, right? This is more of a, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's a much better approach than taking somebody with a, whatever degree they had, which they don't know anything anyway. I mean, we finished college just to have fun, get drunk, have sex and find out, get a degree. And then you step outside and you say, oh, crap, I have to actually get a job now, right? So, yeah, you, the you... world is very different from, from college to, or university, actually. So, yeah, so, yeah. Um, it's, it's very interesting angles you're coming uh, with there. I, I guess in Denmark, we are very fortunate because uh, it's, it's for free. So we can go to universities and uh, business yeah. schools if, without paying any money for it as such, unless you get these extra degrees, then you actually do pay money. So for me, it was a mix as well. Some of the educations I took, I've paid for that as uh, well, but the universities uh, and business schools in general are for free. Uh, but I do see as well in in, in all the management uh, positions that I've had when I've hired in young people, uh, those who are the best ones are usually those who both have some kind of school and degree, but then also work with things practically because those who comes out from five, six years in the university, they don't really know how things roll, right? Because you can't really read that in a piece of paper or, or that kind of thing. So I think I like to sort of uh, work with the mix of it uh, and also taking, I think it's really important that you take um, sort of modules and strategies and things that you can pick up from, from, from courses and field books and that kind of thing. But then you have to modular it into how it fits into your purpose, into what you're working uh, at mm -hmm. right now. And that's, that's kind of where the magic uh, happens, I think. So, so I would say a mix, yeah. So, so you didn't go to the traditional university track, and and no. you 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 <laughs> specialize in some areas. Um, Fifteen years of your career was spent with Nordia, yeah. right? Which is yeah, yeah, yeah actually I'm, almost I'm, sixteen. It's crazy to 16. think of. <laughs> uh, it's and again, I'm I'm reading for my notes. It's Finland's largest bank. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, North European's biggest bank. So, so we're situated in all the Nordic uh, countries. Yeah. So, um, but we are on the Finnish stock exchange. So, just so that so we get a sense of to the the scope of of what you've done there. Um, so, how you said it's it, it's a big it, it's based in Finland, but it's in all the Nordic countries, right? Yeah. Um, yes. So how how large is the bank? How do you measure? How do you measure a bank? Yeah, how do you measure a bank? That's a good question. And I was not even in the bank itself. I was actually in a daughter company called Nodia Finance Company. So it's actually a daughter company to, to the big banks. So we were working more with financial uh, products and within the areas that I mainly specialized in, it was the retail banking. So it was a lot of co-creations with fintechs and a lot of co-creations with different big retails. Uh, and car dealers and that kind of thing. So, so we are a bit different from from the okay. main bank. Yeah. Okay. So, but so I would not... say within our area, we were like fifteen hundred people, more or less, in in the units of United Finance Company, and then the the total of the bank, around ten thousand people or so. Uh, it was bigger at some point, but as you know, a lot of the branches banking has changed a lot over the last twenty years. So going from being a lot physical uh, at a very variation of uh, branches, you don't see that much today, at least in, in, in the Nordics. Lots of um, the services for the banking now is online. So you don't need the branches. People don't go into a bank anymore like that. They take uh, things on their mobile um, device uh, and do a lot of banking there. Or if they need to, then they'll just have an online meeting with their uh, consultants mm -hmm. at the bank. So, so things has really changed. So you don't see as many people as we were at that time for the branches part, but then of course, then the headquarters has changed a lot because then it's it's, it's different kinds of capabilities that you see going into a bank today. Mm -hmm. And I guess that was also why it was interesting for me because I was kind of in the first move of crazy people, like very different personalities of what you usually see in the bank 
because I come from this uh, creativity and innovation world. So that was actually what uh, my mission was to try to, to, to create that insight, a big corporate institution. And that has been a really interesting, amazing journey, actually. So, so I was, I was just going to ask you, um, you didn't want to do accounting, no. <laughs> but, then, but then, but then you wind up with, to me, it's probably the next most boring thing, which is working yeah. for the bank. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. how did you, how did you come across the job at the, what was your yeah. first job at the bank? <laughs> yeah, it's a crazy story. Actually, just before I tell you that, it's actually funny what you just said, because my mom always told me that just get a job in the bank, you know, it's a good, decent job, you know, you know what you're getting. So that was funny. So it was kind of a fun call uh, to call her up and say, mom, I now got a job in the bank. Um, but anyway, I started, when I started in, in Nodea, I actually worked with card management. Uh, so before I came to Nodea, I was working in the chip technology industry, actually working with product development with the chip technology. So it was mobile phones, but also a lot of payments. So we were just in the start of the, the, the 2000s there, where, where, you know, there was a lot of technology going on around what you could put onto a chip. So the whole payment part, loyalty cards, um, gift cards, uh, we were actually the team that I was working with at that time, we were one of the first teams in Denmark uh, in the Nordics actually uh, coming out with these electronic gift cards, which is now very normal in all countries around the world. Um, but at that time, there was a lot of that. And then suddenly I thought, okay, I saw an opportunity in Nordea that they were hiring in new persons that they wanted to kind of reform the way that they work with the cards. And I thought, hmm, maybe I should uh, go for that one. And I was lucky enough mm. to, to get the position. So I, was, I started as a card manager uh, within Nordea Finance at that time. So, you know, what's interesting, it's sometimes maybe it's uh, it's difficult for people outside the U.S. to get this piece. But uh, for me, as a uh, even though I've lived here for 30 years, I'm still a foreigner, uh, and, and, you know, half <laughs> yeah. my life in a different country. But I, I had the the uh, I guess I was fortunate enough to my throughout my business career to actually travel around the world. So you get this perspective. Uh, that's outside the U.S. The U.S. tends to think of itself as we are the best country in the world, where everything is the best here. But mm -hmm. in reality, that's really not true. And and when it comes to technology, especially, uh, even though we have a lot of talent here, uh, it, it took forever for the U.S. to catch up to the Europeans and even mm -hmm. to some degree, some African countries in the use of mobile technology. And yeah. that. maybe part of it, it's because we have more criminals than anybody else, so they they were afraid of the cybersecurity risk of what happens. <laughs> I don't know, but um, it, it's kind of funny. It, it's kind of funny because I remember uh, I, I, I actually traveled to Finland on business, but I was somewhere in a European country, and I, I was walking around and I was eating something in the street on the way to a meeting, and there was a big garbage can in the street. And I walked over to throw the garbage and there was actually a handle that comes out like this, yeah. right? So yeah. you could actually push it. And, and I stopped and I said, holy crap, this is so <laughs> simple. But we don't have that in the US. I mean, you have to push your, your, your hand through the dirty thing and shove it. Out. So anyway, this is not technology, but just my stupid disassociation mm -hmm. of things that I remember. Um, so I... I might ask you some tough questions during the interview, not tough for you, but tough for me, right? For, because of, so I went to Nordia and and I, I always love to see corporate mission and value statements, right? Because I, I think the people that write them, write them because it sounds and looks good. And it's very rare for companies to actually live up to their whatever they say, right? So, yeah. so Nordia says, help <laughs> our customers fulfill their dreams and aspiration right yeah and look that that's not how we look at banks right when, when you say bank to me um and, and i just got my american express card right that's something new that i applied to right to me a bank to me is either a place that if i had no choice i have to go in there to talk to somebody at the bank or something happened or Nobody uses checks anymore or deposits, right? We all take our phone and 
but something happened. So you go in and I see the teller is sitting there. The, the mental visualization and concept of a bank to me is just like, okay, there's people sitting in a building and they do stuff and yeah, now it's on my mobile phone. And if I call American Express, I'm probably going to get somebody in India who's going to help me, whatever the story. It's not we're fulfilling your dreams and aspirations. I mean, it, see what I mean? But yeah, yeah, you, I, I but, can see where you, you come from. But, but you describe yourself in, in everything you, you write and some of your talks, even though I was excited to see that you were on a podcast and I clicked on it and then... It started with, I think, Finnish, right? An introduction. Uh, Danish, actually, but yeah. Dan and Danish. And then all yeah. of a sudden you say, and a blah, 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 blah. And the concept of blah, 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 of change, blah, blah, blah. And I said, wait, are you speaking English? Are you speaking Danish? <laughs> and, and and I gave up. So back to this, um, your approach as a change agent, somebody who believes in transformation, you go into a bank that says, well, our mission is to help customers fulfill their dream and aspirations. For me, it's no, your mission is to make as much money as you can. So how do you bridge the gap, right? For you. Yeah, right? that, it's an interesting uh, question. I can definitely see where you're coming from. But I would say that uh, what we were trying to do was make it more personal. So it was actually understanding the, the customers and the pain points and where they're coming from and then actually making banking to something else. So instead of being just as you're feeling that maybe you have to go to a bank and then you are a bit unsure about what is actually doable for me. Do they even understand where I'm coming from? You know, where I am? We want actually to open up and, and, and sort of meet people where they are, like really show them that we want to support you to understand, okay, where are you in life? How can we support your dreams and aspirations? That was actually where we were coming from. And that was one of the reasons why I actually thought it was interesting also to be part of this because we really tried to humanize the way of doing banking. Uh, so it was not just a number uh, in a line, as you were saying before, uh, but but really working with with the human part of it, um, and that was what I was trying to do in in the teams that I was leading. And uh, since I was put in charge of of building the innovation part uh, up from the ground, so we were really trying to take this human aspect into everything we did, both from from the con consumer perspectives of the customers but definitely also inside the organization for all the employees as well. Because I believe that if you as an employee really sort of feel good with yourself and is in, in a team that is supporting and growing you, then you also show differently towards your customers as well. So for me, it's, a, it's an ecosystem that has to kind of roll with each other as a balance. So, so that was kind of the interesting challenge. And uh, just to be clear, although I... I was trying to be cute and talk about banking as yeah <laughs> in this, but but your role was primarily on the b2b side right so the business to business or or is it also consumer cards definitely also consumers because how we actually see the business is that we we are a business to business to consumers so so we also need to support our business uh, to to with their customers as well so so when you are going out for instance working uh, in an ecosystem with retailers, you also need to definitely understand how their target audience is acting here. Because if you want to provide financial services that kind of interlinks with, with their processes and how their value propositions look like, then you definitely also need to understand the customers. So I would say a big part of my job was actually to investigate how consumers in general look at banking, what are their pains, what are their fears, how do they interact? What do, what are the wishes? How how do they generally want to, want to interact also with retailers? So basically, what we did was we tried to remove a lot of these pains together with the retailers to make it as smooth as possible to to do a purchase. Uh, you can say so. So that was kind of our way into this. So so definitely. So, so you're 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 speaking my language. You're speaking the the language of marketing, which is first thing you do is you go and identify what are your customers needs yeah. and issues and problems and you try exactly, to solve them. Exactly. So, but again, for a bank, um, how did you do that? How did you actually get that, that feedback or uh, what did you do to be able to connect with those customers and, and get to understand their aspirations, their challenges? I mean, bank, banks are really conservative. You bring in more innovation and approach, but, you still have to go speak to customers. How did you get that data? Definitely. 
we actually did went out and spoke to customers. Um, we, we spoke to them directly. So we were visiting stores. So for instance, if we were doing a cooperation with a big uh, retail, uh, we, we would go out there and then interact, see what how it looked in the stores, what were people doing, how were they interacting? We would even uh, ask them questions. We could do videos. Uh, so And of course, we'll also do a lot of desk research. So it was always a combination. And then when we were like going into maybe more um, prototyping, we would do some some prototypes together with the retailers and then we'll test it out again. So, so we had a lot of uh, direct input from the customers. And I believe a lot in that. I think that that is the core of business development. Uh, you, you need to really, truly understand your target audience. Otherwise, you won't be able to, to provide them with the right uh, value proposition. Mm -hmm. Never become a success. So, 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 so we did a lot of that. And that was, of course, a lot to change inside of the organization of the mindset, spending time on this, uh, on, on the whole pre-phase and whole, the whole ideation phase. Uh, so, so that was definitely a change in the way that we were working. So you, you know that my audience are entrepreneurs and small business owners. And by the way, it's it's almost the same, but I at least mentally I distinguish entrepreneurs from small business owners. To me, the entrepreneur is probably the early stage people who are, you know, taking the risk and starting a business. The small business owner is somebody that's already been doing it for a while, right? But it's pretty mm -hmm. much the same. Yeah. They're all small business owners. And uh, and, and I love what you said because uh, I, I, I kind of like created a term. Maybe I stole it. I don't know. Maybe it came to me in my sleep. But there's a term I I created called lazypreneurs, and <laughs> and and which is pretty much lazy entrepreneurs. And the reason I say that is because, and, and you know, it's maybe it's a generational thing, right? The millennials, etc. But um, the younger generation of entrepreneurs. Uh, are really reluctant to do the things that that you and I did because that was the way to do things. You go out on the street and you talk to people. And if you have customers, you pick up the phone and you call them and you ask them questions. You don't do that for purpose of selling them something, which is when I get a phone call, it's usually, I want to say, and, and, and you know what? Two weeks ago for the first time in years that I've been banking with Chase Bank, which is which is one of the biggest bank here, I had a phone call from my my banker, and she said, "Oh, how's that? This is Kathy. Oh, how are you? How things are going? Great. Just checking up on you. Just wanted to." And I said, and part of me wanted to say, "Wow, it's amazing. A big bank, local branch, is calling me to check up on me. That's just wonderful." Yeah. And then she ruined it. And I okay. and then, then she and started the next, selling. <laughs> Yeah, and the next half was yeah. I just want to make sure you know, like, if you need any money, if you have any loan, if you need any loans, you know, come in. We have the uh, oh god, please! I can't believe you just did that to me. So, but the fact that she called is still important, and definitely and the reason these the I reason, love you calls, as I usually call them, is is very important, and it gives you also in some sense of understanding where the customers are. So, so generally, I, I would say that when you are looking at a value proposition so it should be something that you're interested in so you should only contact the customers with stuff that they really generally interest uh, them as yeah. as such and, or, and building the trust right or if you want to get to know them you you absolutely cannot do it that's just my opinion and I, people can call me stupid it's okay you just absolutely cannot do it by sending a survey monkey and some of those stupid things out. I'm not saying that research is not valuable. Mm -hmm. It is. But it can't be instead of an opportunity to have a personal conversation with someone where they can actually first feel that you care and then they're going to open up and tell you what are some yeah. of the challenges they have, right? You can't do it from a survey. And, you know, when I was in a corporate world, I, I used to get tons of these, like a beautiful envelope would come in with three pages of survey and a crisp dollar bill folded in. Here's a dollar. Thank you for your opinion. And I would look at it and it say, it's like, you're crazy. <laughs> okay. My time is worth more than this dollar. I know for you, it's probably worth a hundred dollars. But um, I I participate. If somebody calls me, I would give them 15, 20 minutes of my time if it's something that's related to me and that I feel that my information can make an impact like you did. So, so you were leading sort of innovation 
pre-innovation, and you said early 2000s, which was really early, right? Um, it, so, uh, you know, my point is that I think some things I was thinking about is that in many ways, it's easier to do what you did in the Nordic countries because they tend to be small and they might be more receptive because they're much more personable. They're much more social. When, you know, if, if we get a call from anybody that we do business with, the first thing that comes to mind is what are they trying to sell me, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think I actually think that goes for all customers, even in the Nordic. So it depends a lot uh, on on how you actually present yourself and how you are going about this, uh, I would say. So it's a lot about the empathic and, and how you actually bring it in. So I don't think that the customers are that different between the US and, and the Nordics actually on that particular uh, point uh, of view. But I think, yeah, you are right in terms of the technology part. We were quite far ahead um, in the Nordics in many ways. Uh, and I think some of it, actually, you were also discussing that a bit uh, earlier with yourself there. Uh, I think it has to do with the fact that, at least in Denmark, we quite early on when, when the PC came with the internet, everything was booming there, they saw quite quickly that the whole uh, older generation needed to have right away education on how to use these devices. So generally what you see in the Nordics and especially also in Denmark is that the variety of the general population is really high when it comes to using technology, like knowing how to, to use an iPad, use a computer, use uh, different kinds of apps, uh, all these kinds of things, identifications uh, that is online, um, yeah. all of this. So because of the baseline is really high here, a lot of the um, sort of uh, pushing through with new apps or things, the, the kind of the, the whole process part uh, goes digital much, much faster because you don't have that huge part of humans who don't really know how to interact with the digital world. So that's why a lot of these uh, implementations can go way faster because you generally have much bigger a group of people who just takes it in and start using it. And it's interesting that there was a um, a large a uh, fashion sort of company locally where I live, uh, where they sold mostly men's suits, mm -hmm. and had an interesting business model. But their slogan, I, I love to this day, said, uh, "It's I Sims, an educated customer is our best customer," right? So it, it was brilliant. And because you and I kind of share a love for behavioral sciences, behavioral neurosciences, uh, we also know that if I'm faced with a piece of technology for older people, it could be anything from a cell phone to, to an iPad, it doesn't matter. Um, but you actually take the time to educate me, to make me feel comfortable with it. I will forever remember you because that's the impression that you left with me. Maybe one day I'm not going to do business with you, but I'm still going to remember that you helped me conquer that my fears, my frustrations. You opened doors for me. And that's that's sort of like the, again, it's the essence of marketing. It's the the personal connection because, again, I, like for me, marketing is all about psychology. It's all about human behavior. I, I don't Definitely. care. I don't care it's how much. trust. You built the trust, right? Yeah, you built the trust, but it's also, even though we are so techy and so uh, addicted to our digital devices, at our core, we're still human beings and the emotional mm -hmm. connection does make a difference. And people do make decisions mostly on, on emotional reaction, Definitely. more so than analytical, right? So if you can create yes. the connection, and it's not that hard, but it's a lot of work, right? And that's why I say- For sure it is. Yeah, the lazypreneurs, well, no, why, why should I call my customers? Why should I go visit them? Why should I go in the street and ask people questions when I can just send emails all day long and I can send them a survey? And because it's not the same, right? It's just not the same. And you can get information from five people that you spoke with that is more valuable than a thousand surveys that you got because you promised them some coupon or some other thing, right? It's just, it's just not the same. Um, no, and actually it doesn't take more than that, like these five to 10 people since you, then you create a heat map, then you, you easily find out, okay, there the, is the issue that we need to uh, sort of look into right now. So, so it's a very effective way also to create these heat maps if you're looking to, to solve a certain problem. Mm -hmm. so, and it's so also some... pre-work, right? 
uh, yep. like when you are entering into a new area. So it's a really good start to start really understanding where are people coming from in this area, because that can also help you build, you know, which direction should you then go in. Yeah. And, and look, I'm, I'm fortunate to have you on the podcast because you come from a large, relatively large organization, but your belief system and your training and what you do today, which is also business coaching and, and transformation, change management, um, and it's important for my audience because when you're a small business and or if you're an entrepreneur starting a business, the, the scariest piece for everyone is how do I scale this up, right? Because yeah. yeah. to start a business for the sake of saying I own my own business is wonderful, but if you don't make money and if you can't just turn it into something bigger than what it is, then okay so it's feel good but you're not going to be able to survive this way so um i have some bullet points that that i kind of extracted out of your universe and i mm -hmm. i wanted to ask you to sort of explain it it's probably each one of these is an mba class in some of the <laughs> mba mba classes that i used to teach but we'll do this so i utilize behavioral design and neurosciences to ensure the organizations are prepared to take on the necessary challenges, okay? Um, yeah. What challenges? And yeah, how what challenges? Prepare? Yeah. Yeah, I would say that that what I see a lot is that when you're, for instance, looking into doing a digital transformation, as we have also sort of been a bit walking around uh, here, uh, I often see that people overlook um, the human part of it. So. We as humans need to change the way that we are working, thinking, that kind of thing. And that's not something that just happens, you know, overnight. So you really consciously need to think about how do you actually uh, go in with that in an organization. So it comes all from the top uh, that they understand that if they want to implement a new strategy, they want to implement a new software, they want to implement a new product or whatever it is, this impacts a lot the whole organization and how we are actually working together, thinking, you know, uh, each person will sit back and say, ooh, uh, this is changing the way that I do my job today, you know, am, will I be good at it, you know, for, for the future and that kind of thing. So there's usually also fears in this. So, so it's really coming in with that empathy and then understanding where people are coming from, how we actually as humans take decisions and how we can work with this in an organization to support each person to actually thrive in this change instead of getting scared of it and not daring to maybe go into this change. How can you then work around each person to make this mm -hmm. as a joyful ride uh, and feel that you are actually getting empowered and growing yourself uh, in this journey as well? So that, that's more or less mm -hmm. what I... I try to so, work with, uh, and they use the neuroscience and behavioral design skills. So I'm, I'm going to translate everything you just, oh, every, every brilliant <laughs> word you just said, I'm going to translate Sorry. it into, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to translate it into more of a, uh, maybe a practical interpretation that I have of what you said that relates to the audience of entrepreneurs and small business owners, right? And it really comes down to that if you're a business, whether you're a bank or whether you're a new pizza store, I don't care what it is, um, and you're in business for a purpose, right? Um, if you're going to disrupt, even in a small way and create change, uh, th here's the principle. The principle is you, can't, you cannot do this alone, right? The CEO yep. of a bank and the owner of a company can never ever do this alone. They need a team around them. A team could be two people, a team could be 50 or 1500. And I think what you're pointing out is, is before you go and implement your mission and, and value system and differentiations to your customers, it starts internally, right? You The people yes. internally have to go to the same transformation, embrace it, right? Be trained on it, have the mindset of, I understand, what this is about, yeah. then you yeah. can, then you have a functioning organization that's all on the same page. And now we can go carry that mission forward, right? And which exactly. we, which, which typically the, the issue I think that you're pointing out to is yes, the, the, the big people, the executive branch and the fancy consultants that they hire to write all kinds of stuff and develop products, that's wonderful. Those are done at large scale economic models and, and marketing plans. But then it's really important that 
we talk about banking industry, that even down to the teller at a bank, right? Everybody is on the same page. That it's not Definitely. like, oh, uh, this is something that I don't understand, but it's my job, so I'll just say it. So in in I mean, I used to call this in my in my graduate school. It's the word is congruency, right? Congruency, pretty much in simple. I like to simplify stuff in English. Walk the walk, talk the talk, right? You can't yes, exactly. you can't say you can't say one thing on your website, but nope. then the minute but then the minute somebody picks up the phone in your company, it and starts to talk to a customer. Exactly. It's completely different. And yeah. I think what you point out, even internally, right, in internal communications, right? So, yeah. I mean, so, so this holistic, what you were aiming there is, is exactly this holistic view on your value proposition as well. And it has to be just as internal as ex external. And you are fully right. As a consumer or as a customer, you see the whole thing. So exactly as you were saying, yeah. like if you meet something on the internet and you believe that the company is that that, that's what you should feel when you then meet with the person in live or in the store or whatever you, you interact with that company. And if you don't work like holistically with your whole organization and the process and the structures, the way people interact and so, then you won't mm -hmm. get that result out of it. And many forget that. And they also sometimes down prioritize the time it actually takes to make this happen. So, so they, they usually simpl simplify it. Um, so they don't, spend enough, uh, put enough uh, resources and, and time and money into actually making this happen. They think this is something we can just fix in some few weeks or, or months, mm -hmm. but it's people we are talking about. And it's usually when something like this, it gets introduced, it's, it's, it's big changes. We know ourselves, right? If we have to do things differently that we did yesterday, it takes us a while to actually get familiar with doing stuff differently. And we usually go back again to what we used to do and then ah, oh, we really have to spend a lot of energy right on getting that thing right and some sometimes i you know often i see in organizations that they don't really realize that this is actually what's going on mm -hmm. so you have to give the space and time for people to actually get familiar with the new ways of working and you need to help them with with structures you need to have external triggers helping them go in the mm -hmm. right direction for this to happen otherwise you'll just stay where you are so you know, companies p spend a fortune on on brand marketing, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And even even in my audience, which are, which are smaller businesses, you still spend money on marketing yourself. And but the the best definition of brand that I've ever come across, which I I believe in, am I just I think it's Seth Godin. Um, it's a brand is not your logo and it's not your the graphic design of your company has nothing to do with that brand it really comes down to the promise that you make right mm. what is the promise that you make to your customers that's your brand and if you deliver in that promise whatever the promise might be right if you deliver on it you get to live a long life because people will then continue to buy from you and my example always because i am Okay, people can, might not like it, but I'm an Apple guy. I, I love Apple products. The only thing I would ever use will be Apple products. Uh, I've tried Microsoft in the corporate world and everything used to break and I had to reboot everything <laughs> and I just gave up. But yeah. the promise that Apple made in originally was I'll give you a beautifully designed product that's easy to use and it's always going to work. And oh, by the way, if it doesn't work, because nothing's perfect, you come to the Apple store and they're amazingly friendly and helpful. Or I can call Apple support and they're all trained professionals. They're not outsource people in different countries. And so the promise that they made continues to live. So I don't have a problem spending $1,200 on an iPhone or you know wearing AirPods because when I put them on, it connects automatically to every product I have. I don't have to stumble with it. So uh, that that was the key, right? It's just, if you're exactly. going to make a promise as a company, you might as well, you might as well, you have to train every single person in the company to understand that they are ambassadors of whatever promise you made, even yeah. if it's a purchasing department, right? That exactly. are they're part of a bigger you. thing, right? That's the holistic exactly. approach. Yeah. They're part of the big promise, right? So next bullet is adapting to constant change and implementing strategy as an ongoing process, right? Yeah. That's one of the things. That, so my question is, 
So what did you do during COVID? Because there was nothing in our lifetime that was more disrupting and, and, and a change as what COVID did. We moved everything electronically. So it was kind of an interesting journey, I think, because we used to work a lot in rooms. So we had these lab rooms where we were like poster, putting posters and being very creative in a room together with people. And of course, as we just discussed before, like being in person with other persons is, is really powerful, right? But we kind of, uh, it, this forced the, 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 the whole COVID kind of forced us to rethink how can we be creative? How can we support each other? How can we still make the, the whole value chain kind of connect to each other? So what we did instead is that we changed everything going into to more digital um, processes, uh, which was quite interesting. So, so we used, for instance, Figma, or some of the other uh, bots that you can use today. And that gave other perspective because what we saw, what I especially saw in there is that when you're working with people um, physically in a room, then those who are very outspoken and extrovert, they are usually the ones getting the most audience time, right? Yep. Uh, so what happened actually when we started being creative and started working together uh, on these digital platforms is that some of the more introverts that was really reflective on things started to coming much more into play. Uh, so it kind of gave us new perspectives on how we were actually working with our whole uh, development uh, teams. Mm. And then what we could do there also is that when we were, for instance, doing customer um, uh, surveys or journeys or anything, whereas before we were only maybe inviting some few people from customer service to listen in to a customer, uh, then we could actually have a whole audience of people listening in. Uh, so it gave us a lot of new opportunities of how we could actually understand the whole value chain uh, mm. from, from a customer perspective, I would say. Uh, but it was scary in the beginning. Many people thought it was really scary to be so much online, being on, on a video camera on the time, working there, being, you know, we, we could have meetings for the whole company suddenly. We could gather everybody uh, like in a split second, whereas we had to, you know, uh, invite people for meetings, going in, booking rooms, uh, flying people in or doing stuff like that. So mm -hmm. a lot of stuff became much easier. Because, but of course, the really important part was also to still keep it personal, right? And there I introduced some tools where we actually got really personal, like making sure that you still, even though you are between the screen, uh, you still get to know each other. Uh, so, so that part you of course still have to cater for. And I would say, no matter what you do, it's still really valuable to, to have people in front of you, but you kind of um, saw different ways of working. So I think to, to today we are much more efficient in the way that we work. So we more gather to, to, to sort of ping pong, have ideas, get to know each other or the more social part of it. Whereas the, 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 the real work happens much more online and you save a lot of time also on documentation, both pre and post. Uh, yeah. So it's interesting because Rory Sutherland, who uh, I follow religiously because he's an amazing behavioral economics kind of guy, he was talking about um, the transformation that Zoom created. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and you sort of appointed, but he said they started yeah. it. They started at Ogilvy years ago. And the, what, the interesting thing he mentioned when he's absolutely correct, that when we when you work physically and you called for a meeting, there there is a little bit there's a sort of like a snob appeal to meeting right where are you yeah. going i'm going to a meeting well who's in a meeting well why was i invited so the meetings were usually just confined to you know certain people and they usually were either the managers or a small team mm -hmm. and by by definition by default that stupid mentality because oh, obviously you can't have 100 people in a meeting so i understand the logistics problem but yeah. What happened was Zoom shows up and all of a sudden you have the opportunity to invite everybody to the meeting. And the people that normally would never be invited to a meeting before COVID had opportunity to show up. And the impact on the companies was that people that had great ideas and great input and actually felt recognized were able to explain and express themselves. And so the value of a meeting went up by 100x because of the, the information that was shared by people normally would have been excluded from that yeah. meeting. So so it, it's pretty brilliant. 
Um, yeah, exactly. But I would say that also in terms of just talking about meeting, then another uh, problem actually then arise because then it was so easy to gather a lot of people. So now you kind of also needed to think of, okay, what actually brings value and how many people can you actually be if you need to take a decision? And here again, in sort of in the behavioral design perspective of it, I think that, that introducing now smart ways of doing meetings that you force people maybe Electronic, electronically in a system not to have one hour meetings, but maybe say, let's start with 30 minutes and then most things can actually be solved in 30 minutes. You don't necessarily need to mm -hmm. spend an hour together, for instance. That's new opportunities uh, sort of you have to bring into that. Uh, so, so yeah, so things change when you get new opportunities, of course, then, then other sort of problems uh, erase there. Mm -hmm. So, um... I know we're getting close to an hour, so I'm I'm going to cut down my long list. Um, <laughs> here's so here's a question for you, Pia. What is the biggest mistake you've seen when it comes to scaling a business? One mistake you can point out to. I know it's an unfair question, but it's okay. yeah, it's a have... it's a big one. Um, I actually think it's it's it it relates to what we were just discussing before that you don't really recognize that giving giving the slack uh, to 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 make the change happen actually that is something I I have seen a lot actually that you you want to for instance implement a new big strategy or something like that and then you you kind of simplify how that's going to happen so not really creating the slack I see a lot of that in organizations where where people have a lot of things on their table, right? Each person in the company has a lot to do. And then this new strategy just comes flying in from the right uh, and you just have to take it in. So people mm -hmm. don't really consider how difficult it actually is to, to actually take that new thing in. They might not even understand it because those who've created it, they have spent maybe months uh, or years on, on thinking out every little detail of it. But then when you sort of uh, get it down in the organization, people not might not even understand what this is about. And if you don't give the slack and the time to discuss, to put things into perspective, to, to help each person to understand what, what is this, how does this affect me, my job, how can I con contribute to making this happen, um, mm -hmm. then it won't happen actually. So I see a lot of really, really super cool strategies, new ideas, very stuff uh, going in there, but then it kind of vanishes out because they don't uh, actually uh, make it operational enough. Can we? Can I substitute the word slack with patience? Uh, patience, or, or, yes. Or, or, or runway, right? So I you, would say, you have, yeah, I would say yeah. also runway. It's it's yeah. definitely patience and in empathy. I would say, but it's actually also the slack in 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 the, in terms of you should have time. So it's back to yeah. when we were talking about behavioral and neuroscience. That, that if, if an organization runs effectively, it should only be packed with around 70% or something like that. You should always have some slack in your system because if you don't have that, you will have these, uh, you know, whoop, bulbs, bulbs or yep. what you call them in, in English, where things are just stopping, right? Yeah, 100%. So yeah. Um, let me end with this and then a quick question. I'm going to read something uh, a recommendation somebody posted on you right um, yeah. she she believes in customer centric business and the fact that we should put customers in the center and organize ourselves and do things around the customer and not the other way around right so uh, it's sort of like a comment and a question to you that i i find it ama i find it amazing actually shocking that in 2023 right um we're still talking about customer centric as <clears throat> as something that oh you should be customer centric i mean mm -hmm. i grew up in a small country with a father who had a corner grocery store right where in israel you know all apartment buildings if you go one literally one block to the left there was another grocery store right and my father was an uneducated guy from poland just started this a store but he had this intuitive survival instinct to know that if he didn't serve his customers, all they had to do when they came down of their apartment building, instead of making a right turn to go see my dad, they would go left and go see a competition, exactly. right? So to me, it's just like, 
it's a no-brainer. So yeah, so all the fancy corporate gurus came up with all these slang and language to make them seem sophisticated, customer-centric, but it's really, I'm not saying the customer is always right, right? We can debate that, which is not really true, but if you have a mindset of serving customers, then it's okay, right? But I, I yeah, you can't it. take away how they perceive things anyway. So, so yeah. even though there might not be true, it's still their perception, right? You have to take that in, no matter what. Yeah. So, um, I when I read this and I said, you know, this is a this is a woman who's dedicating her life to to change management, to to uh, implementing digital innovation disruptions and change. And but recognize that at the end of the day, it all comes down to human beings, right? It's just Definitely. the person and yes. affecting change with a human is is not easy to begin with. But when it comes to customers, uh, really, uh, you, you need to be customer service centric. Well, guess what? If you're not, you're out of business, right? I mean, why don't they get totally it? Agree. Right? But it's funny, but it's still, it is definitely still worth talking about because what you see, especially yeah, yeah. in the big corporations, is that when you are having the different kinds of silos, they start to discuss, even though we are very agreeing, all of us, okay, this is the way we're supposed to go with this particular thing because that will be the best for the customer. But then maybe compliance has some other issues or there's a legal thing or maybe there's something in the process or some technology that kind of stops you. So, so from a split second where you were all focusing on what was the best for the customer, there's a lot of internal blockers that kind of uh, move away your perspective of things. So if you're not all the time very conscious of drawing people back to, okay, but well, we have to go back and then look at what is actually the, the right thing to do here for the customer, then mm -hmm. it, it, it blurs out, right? That's just so I, the fact. I want to... I want to tell you a quick story because because I'm I'm having so much fun with you and you're gonna like it because it it really sort of summarizes some of what we talked about. So the company cool. I spent I spent 15 years with was a small family-owned business under three million dollars, and I was hired to grow it. And we're in the medical industry making precision yeah. devices. And then one day uh, Hewlett Packard, which is a big name, comes to us and said we're developing a new line of inkjet printers. And in our manufacturing, we're actually using needles, which is medical, but not for that. Uh, and we want you to make the needles for us. And we said, great. So they said, well, here's an order. And the order was, I remember, $65,000, which was, at that time, was the largest order the company's ever seen. But Hewlett Packard said, uh, you, you quoted us a turnaround of manufacturing of 10 weeks, we need to have it in four weeks because we're having a national sales meeting in a month and we need to demonstrate all that stuff. So we need to have this ready. So uh, again, this is small company. So it's a father and son and, and I got the order and I came and said, look, the largest owner said, very well done, nice. And then <laughs> and then the old man looks at me and he said, but they want it in four weeks and uh, we, we told him it's 10 weeks. And I said, yes, but you know, Walter, this is Hewlett Packard. And if we treat them well, and they have a reason why they're asking for it, and I explain, uh, this could be ongoing orders for us for a long time. This is the way it works in, in the business world. So he looked at me and he said, um, I don't let these big companies tell me how to run my business. You tell them 10 weeks, not four weeks. And I said, okay, well, let me ask okay. you a question. Let me ask you a question, Walter. The company at that point was was almost 50 years old. So it's not like a brand new company. And I said, let me ask you a question. So 40 years ago, when you started the company with your father and you were selling crutch tips, whatever it was, and somebody came to you with a nice order, what did you do? And he said, oh, that happened a lot. I said, so what did you do? Oh, it was me and my father and my sister and my neighbors were all sitting in, in the warehouse packing everything and we wanted to deliver it before they even asked for it. I said, ah, so what changed, okay? So now that you are a $3 million company, you're gonna tell a, a billion dollar company not to tell you how to run your business. This is exactly the same, right? We should exactly. do whatever we can to deliver within four weeks. And by the way, it was possible. It's just a question of operational scheduling. Uh, 
because it's an important customer. So the end result is, yes, we did in four weeks and, and HP became a big customer, but it goes back Super to cool. the customer-centric thing and, and the message to everyone who's scaling up. Yeah. Don't ever forget the days when you started, when you were sitting in your one-room apartment, packing everything, shipping it ahead of time because it was a question of survival. Just because you're 10 million, 50 million, or a hundred million dollar company does not mean you can take your eye off the customer mindset nope. because it's going, it's going to bite you. Right. You know, in the U S we said companies are, you know, they're not too big to fail, which is exactly the case. Right. All right. So I have a couple of rapid questions for you, Pia. Um, I, I normally, sh that's the only thing I share with my guests. I don't share anything because I want the conversation to be just raw like this. I mean, but um, so which has been really with, nice <laughs> I, I shared them with you very late today you probably didn't see it on LinkedIn so here it is one person that influenced you the most personally so these are like one two word answers quickly yep I don't think that I have one person that influenced me that, that I think I like to wrap myself around a lot of different people who inspires me so I don't have one particular person I think over time uh, I have like a couple of handful of people who really inspired mm. me for different aspects of my life, I would say. But I don't okay. think I can pick out one person. Fair enough. Best advice you've ever received? Um, be true to yourself. And last one, uh, I'm sure in your travels, you came to New York and you went to Times Square and there's giant, giant billboards all around yes. you. Yes. If I gave you one of those, what would you put on it? Be kind to the world. Okay, be true to yourself. Be kind to the world. Uh, can't think of a better way to end this fun podcast. Uh, thank you again for spending time with me from Spain. I'm still jealous. Um, <laughs> I I will send you the transcript so you can share it in Danish and Finnish and Swedish or whatever. And uh, your contact information will be in in the podcast and uh thank you again this was this was a lot of fun thank you so much it was a pleasure being on your show thank you thank you take care